take one. Hi, my name is Pedro Lopez and I run the Human Computer Integration Lab at the University of Chicago. Today we have five papers from the WIST 2023 conference to present to you. The first one is on the floor. Keigo Yoshiyama and I engineered a haptic device that we call FITRU. These little electrodes here allow me to feel tactile sensations electrically stimulating the sole of my feet. Every time I feel one of these, it could represent, for example, to turn left or right, like a sort of Google Maps for walking. Now, what's interesting about making this device with these flexible electrodes, very thin electrodes, instead of using, for example, vibration motors, which is the sort of standard in haptics, is that I can also feel the edges of stairs and features of the natural ground and terrain as I'm walking through. What we found that is really remarkable with feed through is that using this as a haptic source of the information instead of vibration motors allows people to feel much better what's under their feet and not get confused whether they're feeling a vibration from the devices or a vibration originating in the real world. And this is a safer way to walk with a haptic shoe. The other thing that is really interesting about this is that we can make feet through in many, many form factors. What you see here is actually a sock that has all these 60 electrodes inside of it. And we actually cut this hole through just so you can see how you might wear it and walk on it um, on your haptic experience. You could walk it with a sock, you could do it barefoot like I'm doing right now, and have an assistant experience as you're walking around the world with feet through. The next project that I wanna to show you to you is one where we're trying to investigate also a form of stimulation electrically, but in this case, we're trying to turn it slightly different. This is Akifumi Takahashi, he's a co-author in this paper that is called Magnetic Muscle Stimulation. What we're doing here, and this is a paper led by Yudai Tanaka, is doing muscle stimulation without having to touch the muscle. So Aki's going to demonstrate by stimulating my muscles with this electromagnetic coil. So as you can see, let's do it once more. My hand involuntarily moves when this coil gets energized and sends an pulse. What's really interesting about this technique, instead of using electrodes, actually someone could find electrodes and throw them to me, is that we can do this through the clothing. So Aki is now going to demonstrate this through my clothes. No contact is being done with my skin. Let's do it once more. And this is really in contrast to using electrodes, which is something that our lab has been using for the past 10 years or so, in which we need to adapt and contact the skin with these electrodes. Now, these are obviously much smaller than these large coils, but the idea that we can do the stimulation without physical contact opens completely new applications areas. And I just want to show you one of them, which is to do the stimulation over a distance. We can actually do this distance up to five centimeters away. So Aki's under the table holding the coil. And this table is about quite a few centimeters thick. And I'm going to put my hand here. And as you can see, my hand is being activated. Let's do that once more. Just through this distance of the coil. So with this idea, thanks Aki, with this idea of magnetic muscle stimulation, you can open a new range of applications that might require force feedback. You could use this for virtual reality, which we've tried. You could use this for guiding someone's moving over a piano or playing an instrument without having to connect these electrodes on their muscles. The other benefit of this is that because there's no physical contact with the skin, the skin receptors don't feel the electricity. And so this feels much more comfortable than traditional surface-based electrical muscle stimulation, which is a reason why we're really excited about this. All right, now you might be wondering why I've been wearing this strange little device close to my mouth all the time. So this is actually a taste device. I'm gonna hook it to the corner of my mouth, and you can also notice that in the back, I have these little reservoirs. Many of them are connected to these tubings. So this device can deliver tiny droplets just when I'm about to eat in virtual reality. So let's try this out. So what I'm about to do in virtual reality is first dismiss this setting here. Wonderful. And then what I'm gonna do is to grab that object that I see right there, which is a Blackberry. So I'm grabbing this Blackberry and in VR, virtual reality, I see a Blackberry, 
in my hand, I know I have a blackberry because Jazz was here and is the lead author of this work, just handed me a tray full of blackberries. So, of course, this feels super realistic because I'm seeing a blackberry, I'm eating a blackberry. Now, notice that this bush just changed and there's actually a new object in there. It is a lemon. Now, I know I don't have a tray of lemons here, but let's see how I taste this experience. I grab that lemon slice, and it feels very much like a lemon. It feels almost like slightly acidic, like a lemon would be. And you're probably wondering how is that possible, because I have a tray full of blackberries. So just before I ate that second blackberry that I was actually holding a lemon, these tubes delivered a tiny amount of a chemical that we call a taste modulator in this case, lactazole, which decreases the sweetness inherent to the blackberry and brings out its acidity in result. And that comes close to the experience of tasting a lemon. It still tastes kind of like a lemon. One of the reasons why Jazz Brooks is really interested in this is because I just decrease the sweetness. So what happens if I take a drink of a very unhealthy drink? It tastes very bland, very boring, almost no sweetness. This could be a completely new way to interactively deliver an experience such as a dietary intervention. I might take out my phone and sort of self-regulate my own eating behavior and drinking behavior to, for example, stay away from sugary drinks. And this is a direction we're really excited to try out with this project. Thank you. All right. Next, we're going to switch gears into sort of being critical about one of the things that we produce a lot in our lab, which is electronic prototypes. You see here just a box of things that we broke over the years, and this is just one of many boxes. The whole ceiling, you don't see, luckily, is filled with broken prototypes. Now, what we would like to explore is a way for labs like ours to be more sustainable in the making of physical hardware devices. So, what I actually have here is KiCad, the most popular open source tool for editing schematics. Now, this KiCad has a very, very small addition to it. There's a plugin running in the background made by Jasmine Lou called EcoEDA. The Eco part of EcoEDA stands for ecological. It helps you to think through how you might recycle things that you have in the trash bin, but you forgot that you might have. So let's actually do a little experiment where I'm going to add a component of a circuit and I'm going to add a component called a 7805. It's a very popular voltage regulator that I like to use a lot. Okay. So I'm going to add this here. As you can see, I've added it. And now the, the software that Jasmine is using is going to suggest and look at all the possible devices that I have in my trash bin. It knows the inventory of things I've trashed over the years and actually says, hold on a second. You don't have to buy a new voltage regulator. There's plenty of other options in your trash bin that they are suggesting to me. So this is, this is kind of, has a lot of smarts and in fact can tell me different possibilities. It can tell me, replace this one with another one from the Febreze, which is a little smell device that we had in the lab and have destroyed in the meantime. But it also tells me there's plenty of others you could use. You could use one for one of your own prototypes. Or you can even alter the prototype or the circuit just slightly to modify and use another reusable device. What is really nice is that all these devices are at my disposal. I don't have to order, get anything in you, and I'm not contributing to more extractive practices that generate more waste streams, in particular e-waste, to the planet. So Jasmine is here, and she has actually a couple of examples that she can show to you. This is one that we like the most. This is an electronic conference badge, and maybe some of you might recognize this screen. It's from this iconic Nokia phone. So this electronic batch was entirely designed from components that are all recycle from electronic waste, just like this one. Thanks, Jasmine. All right. I have one more thing to show to you, which also involves the practice of making objects. In this case, it's to simplify the creation of objects. At this point in history of computing, making new objects is very, very simple. Here's a game console that we've been creating in the lab. And you can see that the shape is quite aesthetically pleasing, and its function actually works really well. This game console is supposed to have a Raspberry Pi inside, buttons and joysticks so you can play. 
Now, it's very easy to create this shape with modern software. What is very hard is to create a version that once you actually put the computing interface inside, does not heat up and almost start melting or bending because the PLA used for fabrication is very, very, very soft at a low melting point temperature. So how might makers access this complicating and non-intuitive world of heat transfer? We made a tool that we call Thermal Route. You can see on the screen precisely this model that I was showing you. With this tool, you just need to tell, I have a computer here that will heat up to 80 degrees Celsius and say, solve the problem. What this tool does in the background is it creates many, many, many simulations of potential versions of your object according to your preferences, like how much money you are willing to spend on this specialized black material, which costs quite a bit of your money, how much time you're willing to wait for the tool to run, and if there's any spots that you want the tool to change aesthetically. The tool simulates many, many versions and spits out one, which is the one we've printed here. Now, what's interesting is that this is a physics simulation. So what this means is that this will behave according to the physics that has been simulated. In this case, you will redistribute the heat away from the CPU so that your Raspberry Pi console does not heat up and can keep that top performance. In fact, the tool is so good at designing objects that can withstand the heat that we've done things that even look somewhat unnatural. I don't recommend you try this at home, but if you print a 3D printed PLA based soldering iron holder, once you put the soldering iron there, it's going to start melting. We gave this object the thermal router and told it to redistribute the heat from this point to the base of the object, and this soldering iron holder can actually withstand the very hot temperatures of the soldering iron. So this is thermal router, a tool engineered by Alex Mazursky, and it's one of the five projects they were presenting at WIS 2023. We're really excited to see you at the conference.